Association for the Tipple J 20th Annual Symposium. Joining us is Professor Lisa Miller. Um, Professor Lisa Miller is an administrative judge throughout California and an arbitrator in the finance industry, frequently hearing eight-figure matters for FINRA and National Futures Association. She is the author of FINRA Magazine's multi-part year-long series on e-discovery. She wrote FINRA's educational course on managing e-discovery, including deepfakes and international cross-border discovery practice. She tries cases on demand in state and federal court in California and New York, as well as in administrative settings. So Professor, uh, so nice to have you. And um, we see your screen, so I will spotlight you and you can take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you to the journal uh, for sponsoring this and for including me. I've been uh, with you since the first presentation this morning and have just been glued to my screen. So thank you for this dynamic uh, event. Uh, and also, I just wanted to um, update you. Thanks to COVID, a lot of the judicial function is remote now. And so I'm able to be an administrative judge in Vermont. And it's completely remote. Um, I have to go uh, very rarely, if ever. And um, so I'm really enjoying sort of transporting myself into New England and then right out again into Southern California. So a little bit of a, a silver lining there for me. Um, so welcome to Other People's Money, Navigating Litigation Finance in the Patent Space. Um, for those of you, I know that a number of you on the line are, are students and not everyone. So those of you who are more experienced, just bear with me while I do sort of the basic uh, catch up. So we're all on the same page. Um, it's uh, kind of a, unfortunately, almost a given that if you're dealing in interesting technology, if you um, or your clients are pushing the envelope, if you have that better mousetrap, um, you know, you're in the crosshairs for misappropriation. Illegal appropriation is very common. Um, I think it's uh, kind of like, um, I don't know if any of you ride motorcycles uh, for recreation. There's two kinds of riders, people, uh, riders who've had a, an accident and people, riders who will have an accident. So there's two kinds of clients, those who will have uh, misappropriation or the ones who already do. So it's very common and it really is um, pushing the need for um, figuring out how to either even the playing field or, or just inject some energy into the playing field for these litigations. So um, patent cases can be very expensive. Um, it depends on the number of claims. It depends on a number of things, but it, it, if it goes the distance, these are very high dollar investments, um, but the awards can be tremendous. Treble damages can be available. Um, damages uh, are, can be very, very high. Uh, so even uh, a, a small amount of punitive damages uh, can come into play and really change the dynamic um, if there's a willful infringement finding. So it um, is an area where people can make money and as economic conditions deteriorate, which arguably we're in right now, litigation increases. There's a saying, um, more uh, you know, bad times, uh, plenty of litigation, good times, plenty of litigation. It just doesn't matter. There's always gonna be plenty of litigation. So economic conditions now are very chaotic and unknown, there's international pressures uh, from the virus. So litigation is expected to increase because these economic conditions are so dire. So generally entities uh, monetize through uh, sale or license. And that's one of the reasons to seek protections in IP is to make money, do you wanna monetize? Um, and this is part of the problem with the misappropriation. So when you're losing control of the property, um, it's going to interfere with your ability to monetize. So you wanna protect it as much as you can in this current environment of this 
sort of rampant misappropriation. So that's where litigation financing comes in and it allows patent owners, people who you know, own the property, it allows them to monetize and maintain control over the asset. So it's a terrific option and really works well with the overall picture of we're here to get this terrific uh, patent out there. We want it to serve a purpose. It's a useful item, um, but we don't want to lose it. We don't want to give it away. Litigation finance helps us protect it. It allows us to fight that fight. So it underwrites that litigation and it minimizes risk, which is a fantastic option because it moves that risk to the third party funder. So litigation financing unlocks the patent value for the rights holder. So people tend to look at litigation financing as a sort of an intrusive, you know, unknown that comes into a uh, a closed system and, 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 and changes the dynamic. And it actually is uh, much more part of the process than that. It's really not that much of a foreign entity. It really just works with the analysis that already exists that we've all um, bought into and our clients have bought into, which is we want to monetize this patent. We wanna get full value for it. We are the rights holders. We earned that. We did what we needed to do. And litigation financing unlocks that monetization for us. So litigation funders gauge their claims as investment opportunities. And um, I know we have some knowledgeable funders um, on the line here today. And please um, sing out um, if you think that... Um, we can uh, delve more deeply into some of these concepts. I, I would love to include your comments in this. Um, and I have my Q&A open and I have my chat open. So either one, and I'll try to get uh, that question into this presentation as quickly as I can. So please feel free. Um, so third party investors um, can be these giant companies and most of them um, have gained a lot of their strength outside of the US. Uh, third party litigation funding, there's a lot more comfort and a lot more experience in other countries, uh, including Australia and UK and so forth. And so those companies um, have grown tremendously outside of our borders, which means that there are some smaller uh, investors still around in the US in our uh, ecosystem. So it can be a, a small consortium of uh, people who think this is interesting and they're not attorneys, they just employ an attorney or a service to sort of vet properties. It could be a hedge fund, it could be a private party. Um, and there's the family office uh, also sometimes looking for good investments. It can be any entity. And uh, funders will pay attorney fees and costs in exchange for interest in the recovery generally there's different ways of working this, but in general, um, that's the exchange. So uh, funders are on a non-recourse uh, plan. So their investments um, are lost if the case uh, tanks. And that is something that a lot of people forget when they look at the somewhat high interest rates or the balance of the deal and how the repayment works and what the proportions are. And I think people don't realize that this is a little bit of a different investment. So because it's non-recourse, because it's um, a complete and total loss and quite often there's no uh, benchmarks to get small amounts repaid as time goes by. So it's not a traditional sort of loan or type of investment which you know has some repayment over time this is an all or nothing so it it needs to be a slightly different look it needs to have a different proportionality or it wouldn't make any sense um, and in general although funders are vetting cases and they are um, of course welcome to do so right if you're looking for an investor you have to uh, work with them to understand the case and to understand the contours of the financing and you know to have the balance sheet pencil out, um, funders quite often do not actively direct the case. Um, it, it, it would be a unique situation where a funder would come in and start directing 
um, either discovery strategy or trial strategy, they might want to have conversations and certainly they're entitled to when they have this investment going. And that's something that's agreed on early on. Um, but there's a lot of concern about funders directing cases. And I don't know how realistic a concern that is. It's possible that some sort of amateur funders, let's say an individual, would want more of a say, um, but that's the sort of thing that gets worked out in the uh, run up to the written agreement. So in general, uh, the tech industry is focusing on business models tied to collaboration um, and product integration. So they're looking to um, Frankenstein together different types of technology to come up with some unique, uh, valuable uh, technology that can be uh, sold, licensed, outsourced. Um, you know, maybe it could be have a military application and so forth. So there's more of an emphasis on this sort of linking together um, of technologies owned by different individuals leading to much more um, misappropriation and sort of changing the face of this industry slightly. It's um, leading to a lot more pressure on uh, licensing infringement litigation. So it's gotten to the point where some people believe that startups um, have to anticipate as part of their startup costs, patent litigation, um, whenever it wants to license its technology. And that's a big part of how startups survive is by you know, developing something, licensing it, getting some money coming in. And in general, startups like the resources to fight this. There are some um, insurance coverage options most startups don't um, avail themselves of that. Um, in general, uh, they're concerned about other things, um, but it is available uh, in some markets uh, regarding misappropriation. Uh, but the business case, I think for some of the larger companies is that they do a, a calculus internally and decide, you know, let's see what happens. We'll we'll say this is not a misappropriation, we're not infringing. Uh, let's just move forward without a license, without an agreement. And uh, you know, if necessary, we have the resources to deal with a startup that may or may not have any sort of coverage and most likely doesn't, and it, they'll be easy to outspend. Uh, so it's just a concern um, that I think has become a, a standard business analysis uh, point. So litigation financing allows startups to protect their intellectual property and also you know, universities that might have some limited uh, resources to put to these types of things. And it can just shift that cost and that risk. So uh, for those of you on the line who will be general counsels or already are um, uh, handling intellectual property files, you're going to be experiencing or you have experienced this budget pushback um, for funding commercial litigation internally. And um, for some companies, shareholders, you know, can exert some pressure regarding earnings. So you want to have a facility and a mastery of third-party litigation financing. It's, I think, part of your, um, in my personal opinion, part of your responsibility to counsel your client, the company, and maintain its overall uh, legal health. So in general, funders invest um, on the plaintiff side, not exclusively. And when the industry was young, uh, there was investment in individual cases. As uh, litigation financing matured in this country, keep in mind it's very mature in other countries, um, the idea of the bundled portfolio uh, became much more popular. And I think we had a comment earlier uh, saying there, uh, Funders are looking for the greatest bang um, for their commitment. And of course, that makes perfect sense. So the bundled portfolio allows for a larger return um, with a, a single uh, vetting event. So we'll look at this bundled portfolio, cases that have been filed, cases that are not yet filed, and make a decision on what kind of financing, if any, we want to engage in. 
So this can be a mixture of different kinds of cases, but it's a much larger deal. It's a much more sophisticated deal. It's um, a deal with many more uh, concerns for counsel. Um, and uh, as Dr. Greenberg was saying earlier, um, many more layers for uh, a mediated resolution, which is you know, the direction that many, many cases had. So this risk spreading uh, through a bundled portfolio uh, is very attractive. It's attractive to funders um, because uh, they're looking at it from a finance vehicle uh, return on investment uh, plane. And it's uh, nice to allow individuals who have these uh, bundled portfolios of cases to have some financing for what sounds like a fairly active practice. Um, so like in the uh, insurance um, litigation area where um, an individual attorney may have one case and it's very important to that firm, the um, insurance company has a, a whole suite of cases going at one time and the adjuster only has to be right, you know, 51% of the time. So it's a very different risk calculus. So um, in a portfolio setting, um, a litigator will look um, more at this more as a suite of cases. Perhaps we can still be successful when we may be less successful in a particular case out of this uh, group of portfolio uh, cases that have been uh, gathered together for possible third party litigation financing. Um, and law firms um, that have this litigation financing ability, that have this uh, mastery or these connections, and it doesn't have to be just with one company, it can be uh, a different company for a different type of case, smaller for smaller, uh, bigger for the portfolio, however you want to um, put the pieces of your law practice together. Um, but you can then uh, pass this mastery on as an asset that your clients can benefit from. So if you are involved in sophisticated third-party litigation financing, it's possible that your clients can more um, uh, effectively assert their rights or can uh, benefit from being part of a portfolio that's bundled and is financed in that way. So when you are trying to help your clients in, in every way that you can, which of course, you know, we all are committed to doing that, um, you want to be able to say to them, um, our uh, bringing in of a third party to consider litigation financing for your matter is a positive for you, the client, because it adds all kinds of flexibility to our uh, business relationship while leaving us free to you know, do our best on the legal aspects. Um, and yes, these advantages cost money. And it's interesting that people balk at that, that, that there's some understanding, I don't know where it comes from, that you can be financed, um, the case can drag on, you know, there's payment for expensive experts and discovery and who knows what else in an individual case. And then at the end, that somehow it's offensive that, you know, there's a high interest rate that ends up interfering with, you know, the entire amount being, you know, divided between the attorney and the client, that there's this third party who has a priority. Um, there's tremendous advantages to having this financing and this, these advantages cost money and the, you know, time to pay is at the end after the money comes in, which is a great um, advantage for everyone involved when you're trying to assert your rights and protect your, your patent holdings. So that's something that um, I think bears repeating whenever uh, you as attorneys are counseling either your individual clients or your corporate clients um, that eventually, you know, there will be a back end payment on this, assuming that money comes in. Uh, litigation financing is non-recourse. Um, Funders do get paid first with interest. Interest rates are high. Um, it's, I believe, I don't believe that any states have a stated limit 
on interest rates. And there has been some discussion today about how certain states are wading into regulating this area. And it's important for the people on this call to understand that almost all of that, if not all of it, is commercial um, separate. It's, it's for the consumers. Um, it's for individuals who are uh, in financial straits. Uh, for some reason, uh, a, a traditional contingency isn't working or isn't available. And these individuals need uh, financing for a single matter and they have one attorney. It's a whole different ecosystem than intellectual property and especially in patent litigation. It's different dollars, it's a different business model. Um, and most of that, including West Virginia and so forth, it's all for these consumer cases. It's very unlikely that your cases um, where you're the intellectual property counsel, either for an individual or for an organization would be considered a consumer matter. And these rules, it's very unlikely would apply. Um, I don't know that necessarily it won't start a trend where eventually commercial cases won't be affected. Um, and right now it's, there's some requirements, but it has much more to do with sort of administrative basics. Like if you're going to be a third party funder in our state, you need to register, things of that nature. Yes, there is some um, uh, litigation um, interference, but it's it's really um, more procedural um, and, and really at this point, pretty far away from patent litigation. Um, interest rate rules don't apply. A lot of people don't realize that um, because it's not a loan. Um, and just always know that, you know, intellectual property, especially patent trials are not quick. And because we're dealing with interest rates, um, it, it gets expensive um, as time drags on. Um, so savvy uh, financiers who are looking for good cases understand that patent litigation can move slowly and the deal terms are going to reflect that. And that's just a reality. Uh, that clients are going to have to understand and probably um, are going to be unhappy about not because of the funders, but because of the time it's going to take. And that's not the funder's fault. Um, but when you're vetting your funders, you need to make sure that they have the resources to commit to what could be lengthy litigation. Um, and in general, they're going to withhold some funds and see how um, different phases play out. Uh, intellectual property has some steep drop-offs um, mid-litigation, more so than in regular uh, ordinary civil litigation, which is what I'm used to. Um, once you get past the motion for summary judgment, uh, that's when the case settles. You know, you, you know what the case is made of. And um, there's more than one of those in um, intellectual property, especially in patent litigation. So they have these... Um, mid-litigation off-ramp. So it makes sense for funders to segment these deals in a, in a very clear way. Um, and uh, there aren't a lot of um, other drop-offs that would be unexpected. So it's, uh, it helps to structure the deal and it helps clients to understand the deal, even if they may not be sophisticated litigators themselves. Um, and there is a concern, and Dr. Greenberg did a great job of, of uh, going through these issues um, in her mediation presentation. Um, in general, a funder doesn't direct um, the decision-making in settlement, and it's a sensitive topic. But there is a way for a deal that a funder is offering to help uh, facilitate settlement by requiring that um, the cost of funding steeply increase if a reasonable settlement offer just is not accepted. If, if the funder is sort of dragged forward beyond what a reasonable person would have thought would be the end, uh, there are ways to um, make it worthwhile for the funder or, or to sort of um, enlighten uh, recalcitrant clients. Uh, and 
Dr. Greenberg was saying in her presentation that uh, there's a lot of suspicion around litigation funding. It is uh, scary. Uh, the support for it is not universal. Um, there's a concern constantly about uh, what are termed frivolous lawsuits, and I, I think that's a, a poor choice of words. Uh, a frivolous lawsuit has a technical meaning, and if uh, judges and, and courts were finding lawsuits to be consistently frivolous, and if there was a direct connection to third-party litigation funding, it would be very clear. And this has not appeared in other countries, and so far it hasn't appeared here either. Um, as the third-party litigation funding in this country matures, as the industry grows, um, it's my understanding that no study has shown an increase in uh, baseless uh, lawsuits. Um, there's, I don't think, any motivation for a funder to um, provide non-recourse financial support to a case that is frivolous. Um, I, I would imagine that there's some potential for it to happen at some point, but it's not part of the DNA of this industry. So those concerns are um, constant. And so far, there's um, no real reason for concern as, as far as my research has shown. So once you have a connection to a funder, uh, as counsel, you're gonna have some concerns. So you wanna know exactly what's being financed. Is financing gonna be piecemeal? Um, as costs occur, then they'll be funded, or is it gonna be by phase? Or is it just uh, some expensive uh, module, uh, some expensive part of this? So just your experts or some other arrangement? Is it a partial, is it a full? Um, is there anybody else who's financing? Is there some other uh, pot of money that's gonna be available? You want to know um, and be very clear about the amount of funding, the frequency that funding transfers are gonna occur and what the mechanics of that are supposed to be. Uh, you need to be very careful about repayment terms in, in real detail. Um, and there are so many uh, different ways of um, resolving a case. Um, Third-party litigation funding presupposes that the resolution will be financial. If the resolution is a combination of financial and something non-financial, some sort of action to be taken or to be ceased, um, there's real value to the client there, but it's not really going to work well with a simple um, funding model. So there's all kinds of different ways of resolving a case. Um, it can get very creative in mediation. So uh, you want to work through a number of resolution scenarios when you are figuring out what's being uh, financed and what's not. And, and what the terms are going to look like when some of the repayment will be financial. And it's possible that some very valuable um, uh, achievements can come to the client that are not going to make any sense in a traditional um, funding sense. So you wanna play out those scenarios and discuss that. Um, risk allocation. Um, who's risking and, and how are you going to share it? And you wanna be as clear as you can about things that, like that uh, because that's exactly where the problems are gonna be later if there are gonna be any. And you wanna be clear about the degree of control over settlement. Not that necessarily you're going to have conflict. Uh, it's just uh, an area where you might have conflict and the, the less clear, the more problems. So you want to have some clarity where everyone agrees that there's going to be some participation, but it won't be control um, by all the different parties. It's reasonable that someone who's advancing costs would have an interest in discussing uh, settlement, but at the same time, it's going to be problematic if it's anything more than 
just having a, a, an update and, and having some discussion when it comes to more uh, control than that, then you're, you could be running into some difficulties. And uh, there will be times when the investor is going to want or need to exit. And that's a very complicated uh, scenario that you do need to think about. Um, it's uh, going to at some point happen that uh, you'll want to continue representing your client. Your client's going to want to continue. The funder is going to say, you know, this is uh, materially different from what we were expecting. And uh, we're exercising our option um, to have an off ramp here and we're going to be exiting. So what are the details there? That's worth a lot of your time. So trends in litigation finance. Um, so 10 states have regulated uh, litigation finance. Um, they require registration and it has to be non-recourse, things of that nature. Like any contract, um, a lot of consumers need that right of rescission. Um, it's very common in consumer contracts. These are very standard approaches, um, but generally the laws are not limiting fees. And when fee limiting legislation starts coming along, uh, that's going to have an effect on the industry that's going to be very fundamental. So that's worth monitoring for, for all of you who have these types of uh, futures ahead of you or you're involved in intellectual property litigation or patent litigation already. So the um, COVID lockdowns, um, yes, have slowed litigation. Many courts were closed. Um, it took a while to get everybody uh, remote. Um, it's, it's very slow and difficult to get hold of opposing counsel. Um, meet and confers are very difficult to, to arrange. Um, people have a lot less time available. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, it was rocky and it's still not perfect. Um, but the good news is uh, that in general, litigation financing as an industry is counter cyclical. So all of these difficulties are actually supporting the litigation finance industry and helping it grow and helping it expand. It's pushing it forward and helping it get more sophisticated because as cash shortages hit firms that are trying to you know, stay alive and move forward and press cases on behalf of clients, these are opportunities for funders that may not have existed pre-COVID. So there's a little um, silver lining there that in a tough um, global environment that there's going to be more financing available to um, companies that need it for their bundled portfolios or for individual large cases and so forth. So it's actually um, increasing access to justice which certainly no one would have predicted at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. Um, so in addition, I think that the current, you know, very difficult economic conditions are fostering uh, growth in the underlying industries as well. Um, there's much more innovation, there's more interest in it, there's more immediacy needed. So new markets are opening and existing markets are expanding. So for that reason, uh, patent litigation is expected to increase post COVID and perhaps it's happening already as more people are getting vaccinated. And this is an opportunity to extend the litigation financing industry as well. So it's all working together to grow this industry and making it more available so that more people can take advantage of it and have their day uh, in, in front of a judge. And uh, there's expected to be ex exceptional expansion in the life sciences um, in the patent space because of um, COVID and testing and vaccines and so forth. Um, artificial intelligence is expected to be an expanding market as well. Uh, data centers, remote work platforms, anything 5G related because we need that extra coverage. We need that extra speed because everybody's working from home now. So these are applications that are going to be increasing. They're going to be increasingly monetized. They're going to be um, increasingly infringed. And there's going to be yet more uh, litigation needed for that. And additional litigation financing is going to you know, become more attractive. 
Um, and uh, there is some anecdotal evidence that some law firms are engaging in litigation financing as funders. So it's a separate sort of business unit. And some defense firms um, are seeing an opportunity uh, to fund uh, plaintiff's cases. So this whole uh, litigation financing industry is providing a lot of elasticity and a lot of growth opportunity in a lot of areas. Um, so for the individuals who think that, you know, third party litigation financing is somehow a threat, um, it's actually a, a tremendous uh, engine for growth and, and expansion of, of the economy, especially needed now um, because of the pandemic. So legal trends in the patent space um, that are affecting funding. So infringement filings by non-practicing entities, which are just, you know, we own patents, we, you know, we don't uh, use them. Um, so in the past, um, businesses bought patents from uh, companies that went under uh, in, in similar financial uh, or, or economic times that we're seeing now. So these patents, you know, were purchased and they're owned by individuals who don't practice, but they want to assert their rights. And these are some interesting situations because they're companies that hold patents. They don't really have documents. I don't think anybody who was involved in the development um, is even part of the new company and may, their names may not even be known. And so this kind of thing could happen again post COVID where companies with patents uh, go under, they get purchased at uh, you know, bargain basement rates and then there uh, is an attempt to enforce and it's in a slightly different type of litigation because the normal um, rules aren't, aren't going to apply. The, the normal maneuvers might be a, a little bit beside the point. Um, patent suits do tend to run long. Um, uh, we had a comment earlier that if it's gonna settle anyway, which of course it will, uh, sooner is better than later, absolutely true. Um, you make more money uh, in a longer suit, but uh, you get your money sooner when you have the shorter uh, timeframes with uh, effective mediation. Um, and so there's a number of these uh, early off ramps. Um, there are fact issues that can preclude um, early invalidation, uh, making uh, cases run a little bit longer. There's a more of a hesitation to dismiss. Um, inter re review institution rates have fallen. Um, it's uh, less attractive for defendants. Um, the risk to patent holders is, is declining. Um, eBay, we had heard a little bit about that earlier today as well. Fewer permanent injunctions, uh, which had facilitated early settlement. Um, America invents. Uh, defendants can seek to review to challenge validity and pause the litigation. Um, Alice um, changed the patent validity analysis. Um, there's early rulings in validating patents, um, and sometimes this could happen even pre-discovery where there's limited facts available. Um, Heartland um, regarding where to sue, and that has changed uh, the analysis um, regarding how cases are determined and what you can expect uh, for results, where to file, how friendly is the court, what are your expected uh, challenges. And that's of course going to be recognized in third party litigation funding deals. Um, these are important uh, considerations for uh, litigation counsel as well as those who are funding. So uh, litigation finance in the patent space, um, COVID suppressed the economy, as we all know. So um, patent owners now are looking at more creative ways to monetize. Um, the tech sector um, is integrating more. So there's more uh, licensing discussions and that's triggering more infringement, um, leading to further litigation opening the door to further litigation financing opportunities. Uh, funders, of course, evaluate case values, um, but a lot of cases have not gone through discovery. So limited fact information is available. 
which means that in this expanded, busy enforcement arena, um, attorneys are going to have to disclose or be asked to disclose some confidential information um, on the cases, including patent related details. And that's uh, an issue um, that's going to become more and more important as this becomes a more and more busy arena. Um, so when you resolve uh, validity issues, uh, risk is now somewhat limited, right? That big drop off uh, has been avoided. These are de-risked patents. Um, they're worth more than untested properties and they're attractive for litigation finance investments, but less return because you're coming into the case later. So coping with COVID, um, a lot of time uh, extensions have been provided. So patent uh, litigants are now uh, having more time to pay, more time to file. Uh, things have become much more elastic. So it has slowed litigation even further, which makes funding even more expensive. And again, that affects the deal structure and it affects um, how the uh, whole uh, financial picture is evaluated, not just by counsel, but by the client. The client, of course, understands, you know, third party litigation funder on a basic level, but, you know, the big picture is this is going to go long and it's going to affect not just the deal structure, but how things have to um, end up to make it worthwhile. Um, so funders who cover um, all aspects um, of the case um, are going to be uh, accumulating more of a return. And that's to be expected. Uh, firms with litigation finance capabilities, the ones who are sophisticated users of uh, third party litigation funding can offer this uh, to clients in these very difficult times. And it helps the law firm uh, differentiate its services. Um, in the marketplace, there's a lot of very fine attorneys, very fine advocates. And uh, this is a value proposition, it's a value add. Why not? Um, make things as, as uh, workable as possible for clients who are under pressure. Um, and uh, there's a need um, as the third party litigation funding industry expands, especially in the patent space, for consultants to, to funders, to vet cases, to look at portfolios. Um, there are, uh, knowledgeable attorneys in all practice segments uh, with all kinds of different areas of subspecialization. And it's uh, somewhat similar to years ago when uh, labor and employment firms, which did traditional litigation, began developing uh, a business unit to do in investigations in the workplace. So they were not in the workplace as an advocate, they were in the workplace as an investigator who prepared a report. And this is a way to have an additional income stream into uh, a law firm. And it's very similar here to be uh, an individual who can be available to do uh, an insightful vetting of either an individual case or a portfolio. And um, these deals are generally uh, segmented in the patent space. Uh, depending on where the patent case is when the deal kicks in. So early stage, there's gonna be some procedural hurdles. There's gonna be some potential drop-offs and that adds risk. And of course the return is going to have to be higher. Uh, so early stage litigation finance funders accept a suppressed success rate. And this is going to interfere with the availability of funding and it's gonna change the structure of the deal. Later stage litigation after de-risking uh, provides greater confidence in the outcome. And of course, it's gonna be a slightly lower return um, because even with dollars at risk, um, it's going to be a different analysis than when you were taking the risk um, from, the, from the early stages. So the successful early stage litigation provides the greater return. Um, and that's just something that the client's going to have to understand and accept and make a decision about, is there another way to finance this? <clears throat> and if not, that there's 
um, this is a pretty standard approach. And it's gonna work in the client's favor um, by getting this case moving, by getting it funded, by getting it through these early stage hurdles, by getting it to mediation, by, by keeping the case momentum moving forward. Um, but again, uh, it's, a, it's a business analysis, it's gonna cost. Um, and uh, defendants can also access litigation financing. Surprisingly, a lot of people forget about this, um, but um, sometimes uh, smaller companies have to defend and they don't have enough um, financial wherewithal, uh, not surprising. Most companies don't independently have that. Um, and so litigation financing has a slightly different structure where the funder will um, fund the defense, but will take an interest uh, in the company or profit sharing, assuming that the company survives uh, on future sales. So there's lots of flexibility and there's lots of different approaches. Um, so ethics, um, it's a huge concern. It's very subtle um, and there's a big difference um, among is this a commercial case? Is this a consumer case? Is this a bundled portfolio? And that's one of the problems with here are the rules, right? If, if you're looking for what are the rules and what is the paradigm and how do I apply it? There's enough differentiation among cases that this is going to make some some less so um, and some just not relevant. And it's a, it's a complex analysis and there are people to help. Um, and this is especially aimed at the uh, students or the younger practitioners um, who are moving forward at the beginning of their uh, careers. Um, it, ethics uh, has gotten more complex. And I know that you've had an excellent education in ethics at your uh, schools, but when it comes to intellectual property, when it comes to the patent space, and when it comes to third party litigation funding, um, there's not a huge amount of hours spent in the classroom discussing this. And so there might be some subtleties that are still worth learning. So I just wanted to let you know there are people who can help and uh, do focus on this and can give you really specific guidance and um, will understand the particular issues. So keep in mind that uh, contrary to what uh, some people would want you to believe, litigation financing is not ethically prohibited. It is ethically allowed. You just have to do it in an ethically conscious way. Um, at this point, most funders focus on firms' entire patent portfolios or a big segment of it. There's much less uh, financing going on of a single case for uh, the economic reasons, of course. Um, so when you have a bundled portfolio and some third-party litigation funder is coming in, um, this is a complicated notice issue. Uh, there's ethics issues for counsel here because uh, sometimes the agreement by the litigation funder is directly with the claim holder. Sometimes it's with counsel and in a bundled portfolio situation, it could be a combination. So the American Bar Association has created some uh, rules to uh, deal with this and also recently uh, put out a best practices paper. Basically, um, disclosure of terms, the more detailed, the better. Um, Non-recourse is a requirement and the funders should not be influencing the trial strategies. Um, the professional attorney who has the representation has to wield the um, uh, sort of the, the strategic um, helm on the, um, the direction and the choices regarding the actual litigation itself. Um, funders can get updates certainly, and it would be expected when you're financing something uh, that you would be entitled to some, some information, um, but uh, funders cannot step over the line. And knowing where that line is in advance is invaluable. So it makes a difference if the fun, funder relationship is with the claim holders or with the firm and whether it's a single matter or a bundled portfolio. So you can see, you know, this sort of simple, here's the best practices is already, you know, fractured into, into quarters because is it the claim holder? Is it a bundled portfolio? Is it 
So it 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 it's, can be a complicated analysis, and it's it's not unusual to need a little bit of help walking through it. So one of the big concerns right away for everyone is privilege. Is it attorney-client privileged material? Is it protected? Or is there attorney work product privilege? Or is there a common interest privilege? So just uh, know that it's normal to have um, requests by litigation finance companies for information. Some of it's going to be protected. Some of it might arguably be privileged. The funder is going to want to monitor developments, which is not necessarily an intrusion on privilege, but you have to be careful about where the line is. There's going to be potentially some joint communications with the clients, although not, not always. But funders are going to want to do their due diligence. There's, they're, they're going to need to participate in some intellectual analysis with um, counsel and ideally the client as well. So some courts, the courts are all over the map. Some courts have held that disclosure um, of information to funders waives uh, privilege. Not all courts have said that. And of course, there's uh, you know many courts um, making decisions all the time. Uh, so this is very individual court driven. Um, there's a common interest exception, which is very controversial as well. Sorry, just a quick um, five minute warning here, just so we can keep on time. Thank you. Um, so courts are split. Um, and you need to warn the clients about that. Um, and class actions are different from everything. Um, so be very careful when you are drafting documents uh, to try to weave as much of your um, attorney perceptions into the analysis of the finances so that they're inextricably intertwined. And it's going to be much more difficult for a court to say, um, this has to be disclosed. This funding agreement has to be disclosed. This is something that the other side needs to see or should see. Um, rather, it would be, this is really predominantly a document that addresses attorney's perceptions, attorney's intellectual analysis. This really is privileged and it should be protected and it can help protect your, your agreement. Um, I only have a few minutes left. Um, you want to uh, make sure your professional judgment isn't compromised. Um, you wanna make sure that uh, there's no conflict of interest that accidentally develops. Um, there's going to be uh, a demand for disclosure. Um, we had a comment earlier about what a tremendous strategic advantage it is to know about the other side's uh, funding agreements. So this is an area of tremendous pressure. Um, it's worth whatever time you can put to it to make it as thoughtful as possible. Um, a lot of you will be doing cross-border work because that's the nature of things. And foreign jurisdictions are much less uptight about uh, disclosures. Uh, it's very common and sometimes mandatory. Class actions, always special rules, of course. Um, in a lot of other countries, if there's a class action, it's mandatory disclosure. Uh, there's lots of unresolved issues because it is a growing industry and because all of the individual funders are unique, their deals are unique, and yet more complexity when you're dealing with a bundled portfolio. And there's other issues um, to consider as well, um, including uh, how you're going to uh, structure your retainer with clients when you're possibly going to be subject to third party funding, especially in a bundled portfolio setting. Um, so here's some best practices um, for both sides, um, even for the funders, and a little um, mnemonic for people who are new to this claims. Um, is a way to keep yourself organized when you're making a presentation. Um, and I have 10 predictions. Uh, this, um, oh, man, all right. So this is um, available. Um, I have a white paper, so anyone can um, request this and I'll give you my email. It's lm at lexlawcorp.com, lm at lexlawcorp.com. And you're welcome to email me and you're welcome to call me. Um, 
and 